Hey, everyone. Before we get into today's interview, just wanted to drop a little reminder to stay up to date with all the latest episodes of On The Margin. You can subscribe to the BlockWorks Macro YouTube. Just go up there, just click the little uh, subscribe button, or you can click the links at the top of this episode. It'll take you over to Apple, Spotify, whatever your preferred platform is. Just subscribe there. And if you could, leave a rating and review. Really appreciate it. All right, on with the show. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of On The Margin. Today, I am joined by Travis Kling of Ikigai. Travis, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Mike. Good to be here. Yeah, man, I am pumped. It's definitely been too long since we last caught up. And this was very opportune because this podcast has been on the books for a couple of months now. But you uh, you decided to release kind of this uh, Twitter mega thread uh, and your thesis for 2024 in crypto, uh, which definitely has a catchy title. And, and, and there's a whole bunch of parts to this thesis that we're going to unpack. Some of it intersects with the macro. Some of it is more crypto specific. But the title is A Lack of Pretense That Any of the Shit Does Anything or Will Ever Do Anything. Provocative title, Travis. You have a, you have a way with marketing. And could you, um, could you start at a high level? Why that title? And then maybe we can cascade down into some of your more specific points. on it. Yeah, it did, it did strike a chord. It definitely struck a chord. It, it was, <laughs> I think, far and away the most bookmarked thing that I've ever put on Twitter. And just the amount of people that I had dozens and dozens of people. Uh, you know, reach out to me about it. So it, it, it resonated. Most of, most of the feedback was, was, you know, it's probably like 80% strong agreement. Uh, and then there were some people, I think that just misunderstood the point of it. And then there were some people that, you know, put together some kind of rebuttal to it, but, but it, it definitely resonated. And it just, it came to me over the last couple months talking to other you know, crypto market participants, guys that I have relationships with that I talk to on a, on a regular basis. It came to me after kind of witnessing how last year unfolded, how it looked like this coming year was going to unfold. Um, and just some of the differences between, you know, if you kind of believe in the four-year cycle for crypto broadly, then 2023 was supposed to be like 2019. But you know, 2023, I didn't think was anything like 2019. And Part then, and yeah, and then, and then 2024, it's just the, the broad setup looks very attractive to me with the Fed beginning an easing cycle. Stocks are at all time highs. Looks like they're probably going to keep making all time highs. Um, you know, yields, you know, I think it's pretty safe to say that the highs are probably in for yields. Um, and, uh, we've got Bitcoin spot ETFs and having, and all of that just looks like it's, you know, shaping up to be a pretty good year for Bitcoin. And then sort of like, what is that going to mean for the crypto ecosystem? You know, uh, you know, everything kind of underneath Bitcoin. Hey everyone, we'll be back to the program in just a moment. But before we return, wanted to let you know about DAS London. DAS London is the largest institutionally focused conference in crypto hosted by Blockworks. But I wanted to give you an update because we are now 10 times oversubscribed for this conference. So the bad news is we have actually got to lower, as much as I love you guys, the listeners, we've got to lower our discount rate to margin 10. That's going to get you 10% off. I would highly recommend that you do that soon because you might have noticed ticket prices have gone up 200 pounds and they're only going up from here. And I actually can't guarantee that we're going to have this discount rate forever. Since we last talked, we've had a whole bunch of new great speakers sign up for the conference. We've got Brad Garlinghouse as a keynote. We've got Pascal Gauthier as a keynote. We've got new speakers signed on from Goldman Sachs, from Franklin Templeton, uh, from some of the largest family offices and allocators based out of the Europe. So Theta Capital Management, L1 Digital. And actually on day one of the conference, we're going to be having an investor day, which is a Chatham House Rules hosted by some of the largest investors in crypto. Then the other thing that happened is we've got our VIP tickets that just went live. There are only 60, but we've actually had a bunch of them that just sold out even in one day. So if you want to be a VIP at the conference, make sure you get your ticket. And again, use code MARGIN10 uh, to hang out with me and Mark uh, March 18th to the 20th in sunny London. Cheers. Yeah, Travis, and maybe this is where we can start to, the, the thesis that you outlined is, it actually is kind of, it builds, um, you know, one thing on top of the other. And the first two points that you made in this thread, that both Bitcoin and ETH, I'm, I'm combining here, essentially have a free walk to all-time highs. Can you unpack why you think that is? And what are the implications for the rest of the space with that kind of being a, a big factor? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's everything I just said. Uh, it's, it's the combination of, you know, spot Bitcoin ETFs, 
this unlocks trillions, you know, that's not hyperbole, trillions of dollars of capital to get safe access to Bitcoin that previously could not get that. Um, the Fed is beginning an easing campaign. We've got the halving coming up and macro assets broadly are, are, are acting really well. Stocks are acting really well. Tech stocks are acting really, really well. Um, and there's a lot of corollary to that, to Bitcoin. And then as it relates to ETH, you know, my basic view is that is that ETH is about to run back this same unfolding of the spot uh, ETFs that, Bit that Bitcoin just did over the back part of last year. And BlackRock filed for their ETF on June 15th of 2023, and, and Bitcoin did not trade lower since then. And, you know, we just price just kind of grinded higher through the back part of 2023 as the market was digesting the increased likelihood that we were going to get these ETFs and then started kind of narrowing down the timing of when these ETFs were going to get approved. And, you know, you had the Bloomberg ETF guys and, and a few other domain experts that were, you know, kind of guiding the market into, into the likelihood and price just kind of grinded up and up. And then, and then, you know, I think for the same reason that the SEC was essentially forced to um, approve Bitcoin spot ETFs, which is basically um, they approved Bitcoin futures and they improved Bitcoin futures ETFs. And there just wasn't a legal ground to have those trading and to not have a spot Bitcoin ETF trading. All that setup is is in place for ETH ETFs as well, too. And we can argue about exactly when we think those are going to get approved. But I certainly think it's 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 highly likely to be this calendar year. And so I think for the same reason that it looks like Bitcoin, um, you know, up about 55 percent to reach its prior all time high. ETH is about a double to reach its prior all time high. And I just think both of those assets have, um, for all of those reasons, that strikes me as sufficient to get them back to prior all-time highs. And then we can have a sep you know we can have a separate argument about the timing of that first half this year, second half this year, first half next year, and then we can have an argument about sort of how far beyond prior all-time highs we think both those assets are going to get this cycle. I think those are separate conversations. This kind of free walk concept or sort of like that was specifically to get, you know, to, you know, prior all-time highs or, you know, a dollar over prior all-time highs or however you want to frame it. Um, and I just don't think, I don't think the space has to do that much quote unquote work to get there. Whereas like, you know, you've rewind four years ago and it's f early February of 2020 you know, little do we know that we're about to get, you know, hit over the head with COVID, but, you know, we're sitting there and I, I don't know, Bitcoin price is probably, I don't know what it was, maybe 8,000 bucks, 9,000 bucks, something like that. And we were all wondering, you know, <laughs> how are we going to get to prior all-time highs? How are we going to get a double and a little bit more to get back to 20K? And then you have COVID and then the Fed does $3 trillion of QE in six weeks. And then Paul Tudor Jones writes a letter about Bitcoin being the fastest horse. And then, you know, you fast forward to fall and you got PayPal and then Stanley Druckenmiller. And then, you know, you get there, right? And that's how you got there. Um, and that was like the work. And oh, Sailor, sorry, I forgot Sailor as well, too, in the summer of 2020. Uh, and then ETH had it, got its work from DeFi summer, right? In the summer of 2020. And it's like, that was like the work that got us to, to new to all time highs. And I just don't think that we need like all like this work basically. Cause I, I, I just think it's, we're just going to get there. Yeah. Okay. So Travis, I'm following you on the, the free walk concept here. Do you have any perspective on, I know you said there's an argument to be had about timeline for when this, when new all time highs happened and then how far we go past previous all time highs. Do you have any perspective on either of those two debates? You know, Bitcoin all time high, I would take second half of this year, probably towards the tail end. But if it came six months earlier, I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, I think it's it's really just going to be a function of of Bitcoin inflows, uh, mm. ETF inflows. I think, you, you know, you want to see this GBTC 
redemptions abate. You know, I think Genesis is, is there was an announcement last week. I think that Genesis is, is going to be selling some GBTC. So we're going to have to kind of chew through that. But once, once you see those GBTC outflows, you know, kind of winding down, uh, then I think you're just going to be watching, you know, the inflows of, of the rest of the ETFs. And, and I don't, I don't have strong conviction about what, what that's, that's going to look like. Um, and then it's hard to predict, like, you know, it's hard to predict these big, like, like beyond all time highs, whether we're talking 80 K, hundred K, 120 K, 150 K, 180 K. Well, like maybe one way to think about that is like, you tell me what the this next cycle all time high is going to be for bitcoin and i can probably i can probably guess like what the catalysts are going to be to get there like if you said it's going to be 180k next cycle well i would start rattling off the things that we're going to need to get you there you're going to need mm. a couple more paul mm. tudor jones and they're going to need to buy a lot and then they're going to have to tell the world that they just bought a lot and you, you know, you're probably going to need another couple Elons, like the good Elon, not the bad Elon, right? You're going to probably need a couple big headline publicly traded companies to buy a bunch of Bitcoin, put it on their balance sheet, talk about it. You're probably going to need a sovereign or a couple sovereigns to buy a bunch of Bitcoin and then tell the world about it. Like, you know, to get that to those types of, you know, and then if you're saying, okay, well, the prior, this next cycle is going to top out at 110, well, I think you would probably back a lot of those out, basically. Mm-hmm. And I think that's 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 kind of been how how I've been thinking about it. ETH, ETH is a for me, ETH is a lot harder to kind of guess those types of things because to me, you know, how far beyond prior all time highs ETH gets is going to be a lot of function of how these competitor, how this kind of war with competitor L ones ends up going, and just what happens with L twos and how people are thinking about value accrual on L2s of ETH and just kind of what happens with Solana and some of the new competitor L1s. Um, and I, that I, I really do not have a high conviction on. That's literally a you know a trillion dollar question. And that's not even an exaggeration. It's a trillion dollar question about how that's going to shake out. And I think that's probably going to be, you know, likely the headline thing that's probably going on this cycle is going to be that, that competition. So I, I agree with you. I do think there's an irony actually that ETH, the people from the Ethereum community would really like to be grouped into the Bitcoin community. They view Ethereum as ultrasound money or a form of money in some way. So it is ironic, I think, that despite their wanting to be grouped in Bitcoin, people still tend to group them with the other uh, sort of more tech plays as L1s. But I mean, Bitcoin continues to just be in a category by itself in crypto. Mm-hmm. And for better or for worse, Layer ones, you know, in my view, a big part of L1's sort of valuation is the activity that's happening on the blockchain. And so you need demand for block space on that blockchain. And then people see that and they see these activities, these use cases that are occurring on the blockchain. And then, you know, people buy the token through that. Whereas like Bitcoin, you know, it's, 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 it's basically, it's monetary policy and you know, like it's, it's moneyness basically. And the fact that it doesn't do anything and hardly ever changes at all, you know, is, has been come to be viewed as a, uh, you know, a selling point for Bitcoin basically as it's competing against, you know, maybe gold or maybe U S treasuries, you know, so. I agree. I agree. It's also really easy to grok as well. So one one question that I have for you, Travis, is on how price action might change post ETFs outside of just it's going to go up because there's a lot more money coming into into Bitcoin and potentially ETH now. And one theory that I've had that I'd love to run by you is I, I think one of the reasons why crypto has been so volatile and operated on this four year cycle, there's obviously the halving. But it's also, you know, the next incremental dollar that was moving into Bitcoin or ETH was a retail dollar or someone that was trying to front run retail activity. So it has this very sort of boom bust characteristic to it. And it strikes me now that with the ETFs, 
the next incremental dollar that's moving into Bitcoin or ETH is a structural and uh, it's a it's a passive flow dollar. And I feel like that might have a massive impact on just the volatility of crypto. Uh, the ETFs tend to be vol dampening in general. So do you think this ultimately ends up kind of exacerbating this trend that we've seen on Bitcoin and ETH? And this is kind of a law of large numbers thing too, where the returns, you know, every single cycle, it kind of goes up less and it's a little bit steadier. Or do you do you agree with that whole thesis and idea? I, I do. Yeah, I do. Um, speci- you know, for, on, on Bitcoin first. And then, you know, I think you need to know, you need to guess about when options are going to start trading around the ETFs. Mm. And then I think once we get those, and there's disagreement about that. I, uh, there's, there's, I've seen different people say different things about the timeline about that. But let's just, let's throw a number out there. I don't know, say, you know, June 1st. All right, June 1st, we're going to get uh, uh, options on the Bitcoin ETFs. And then you're going to start having market makers around that. And, and, and my guess is just that that would really drastically change the volatility characteristics of Bitcoin. And it'd probably do it pretty quickly. You know, I don't know, six, 12 months, something like that. You can imagine the volatility characteristics of Bitcoin being uh, significantly changed forever. Uh, um, and, you know, this, this, this tendency for Bitcoin to like, Bitcoin's volatility to, compress, 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 and then expand incredibly violently. That whole structure seems to me like it w- it will fade. You know, I don't think it'll immediately go away, but just that general structure, my guess is just going to fade because of options and, and because of, to your point, the types of participants that are changing. I think a lot of the hot crypto money is going to, like, it's like, Bitcoin is going to kind of stop being like a crypto native trader's asset to nearly the same degree. And it's, it is going to have a lot more institutional, a lot more passive. And you just think about the amount of upside calls that are going to be sold to buy downside protection in a, in a, you know, on top of a spot Bitcoin position or a, or, or, or a position in the ETF. You would just guess there's just going to be a ton of that. And it's gonna, it's just gonna change things a lot. And the, obviously, the venues, you know, moving price discovery, you know, f- you know, from offshore derivative exchanges, unregulated offshore derivative exchanges to, um, uh, you know, the most regulated, most institutional participants, and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's gonna change a lot. Uh, you know, with ETH, I think a lot of that still applies. But then I think the one thing I would say is like ETH's burn mechanism creates the has the potential for uh, a level of reflexivity to the upside that Bitcoin just does not have in its structure. And I think that it's it's easier for me to imagine ETH really could really still run away to the upside, uh, even even with some uh, even with ETH ETFs, spot ETFs being present. Just because, you know, you could just imagine a scenario where, okay, spot ETH ETFs or, you know, people are narrowing in, you know, when they think that's going to get approved, price starts running, it starts getting some more, you know, some use cases start to get some more um, traction, P- block activity on the blockchain picks up, the burn picks up, uh, the burn picks up, so now supplies dwindling, so now price is going up, so price is going up, so activity is going up. So the burn's picking up, so price is going up, right? Like just that reflexivity that I'm talking about, you know, I could just see ETH still having, you know, some 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 real upside uh, explosiveness that, um, you know, I think for us to get that kind of thing on BTC, you're gonna ne- you're gonna need to see some of those big headline catalysts that I was talking about. You know, you get, you know whatever, you wake up and Amazon bought 3 billion of Bitcoin and on the balance sheet, like, yeah, you're going to have some upside volatility, right? But like, you know, it's hard for me to have that as my base case this cycle. Could happen, but, or something equivalent. Do you think, Travis, and just one other point to underscore there as well, which is I feel like people tend to underestimate the impact of 
size of an asset. It's kind of a law of large numbers thing, but it just takes a lot more incremental dollars to come in and move the price of Bitcoin. And ETH, despite it being the second largest crypto asset, is still quite a bit lower than smaller than Bitcoin. So there's more ability for sort of reflexive price movement. But do you, do you think, Travis, I, I've heard you mention a couple of times, you know, corporates coming in and putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Do you think that's actually a trend or was that a 2021 ZERP aberration or what do you think? A great question. I don't feel strongly about it. Could yeah. see it yeah. not happening at all. Could see you don't have another sailor show up. You don't have another Elon show up or another Tesla show up. Uh, and, you know, I could see it, you know, maybe, you know, I could see that, that happening as well, too. And I wouldn't know how to, I don't know how to, that, you know, I don't know how I'd weight the likelihood of that happening. And I think that the way that I've been thinking about it is I would just kind of, it's kind of hard to have that baked in into your base case. But if you saw something like that, then maybe you could readjust what your expectations were for, you know, where do I think Bitcoin's going to get in this coming cycle? You get one or a couple of those and you're like, oh, I was at 110K for the peak of next cycle. And now I'm thinking, you know, maybe we're looking more 150, for example, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it you know, I want to transition into the next part of your thesis here, which is, valuing via sort of relative valuing or about relative valuation frameworks and this idea of financial nihilism, which is a fascinating concept for me. But, you know, can you anchor us for folks who might not be as familiar with you about just navigating crypto cycles? Like where, where is your thought about where we are in the current cycle? And what are some of the sort of hallmarks that you look to it may be a little bit more quantitative hallmarks that you might look at to tell you where we are. So Bitcoin dominance, right, is something that tends to run away first at the beginning of cycles. I don't know if you have any of those, like maybe a checklist of things that you sort of look at. And what's your thought about roughly where we are before we get into some of that other stuff? You know, if the Fed was, <laughs> I think I put this in the, in, in the thread, if the Fed was beginning a tightening campaign instead of an easing campaign, that would have been a totally different thread and we would be mm -hmm. having a completely different conversation. And this idea of Bitcoin having four-year cycles, well, somewhat ironically, the same thing looks like it's going to happen this cycle that happened last cycle, which is you don't really know if that was a halving cycle last cycle. Like, it's like, you don't know if Bitcoin did a halving cycle. What happened was the Fed did $3 trillion of QE in six weeks, sent checks to everybody. Um, uh, completely unprecedented monetary and fiscal policy, completely, completely unprecedented. And then you had a halving. And then Paul, Paul Tudor Jones wrote a letter about Bitcoin being the fastest horse. And then we ripped, right? Mm. And now you're, I don't think we're, it's not my expectation we're going to have the same money printing again, but you are embarking on another easing campaign. The Fed's probably going to cut, you know, maybe it's three times this year. They're probably going to stop QT at some point this year. I, I, it's not my expectation we're going to start QE again this year. But, you know, we're directionally easing and stocks have already sniffed it out, right? And it looks like yields, you know, have probably sniffed it out as well, too. And that always, to me, sets the stage for, you know, how crypto is going to act. You know, and, and this time is no different. The having probably, Matt, you know, it's like the, the cycles prior to 2020, you know, in 16 and 12, I think, I think. The halving did matter, but Bitcoin was a tiny fraction of the size that it is now. And the stock to flow, right? The cut like actually made a bigger difference because you're, you know, you're the daily supply emissions, right? There's the, you know, you know, it, uh, it's just much more impactful. Um, so I, I think that's would be where I would start. And, you know, I do think that it, you know, a year ago, we were going through a really rough regulatory period for crypto in the United States. And things do look a lot better now. There's still a good amount of uncertainty. But the SEC, you know, got smacked properly in 2023 as it relates to crypto. And, you know, that was one of the defining uh, uh, things that happened in you know, in, in crypto in 2023, in my opinion. And I think that helps people, you know, that kind of gives some more cover fire, uh, some more comfort around it. And um, I, I just think that there is a strong mimetic reflexivity that is now present. It's like this like three up, one down meme, right? You're familiar with that? 
Mm -hmm. You know that one? Yeah. Like it's like, you know, three good years for Bitcoin down one year. And it's it's best shown in Charlie Bellello, I think is how you say his last name. Yeah. I saw the charts on Twitter. He's got a great one, which is like all major asset classes. It's like a red and green chart. You've probably seen it. It's like all major asset classes by year going back to 2020, 2010. And it's like three years in a row every year. Bitcoin is the best performing asset class. And then every fourth year, it's the worst performing asset class. And the next three years, it's the best performing. And, you know, it's like it's been doing that, you know, for three full cycles now. Right. And I do just think that there is a very strong mimetic reflexivity to that where people are just going, this year is a good year to be in the casino. And people are much less worried about actual use cases and people are much less worried about in user demand and like, oh, how are we going to get the next 10 million, 50 million, 100 million people into crypto? That it's just like the expectation is for prices to move much higher and for alts broadly to outperform Bitcoin and for some alts to outperform by a, a truly earth shattering amount and that, uh, that's going to play out. And then, you know, after three years, it's going to be, you know, down one, basically. And we're going to have another year of brutality or another 18 months of brutality or whatever. So what's going on, everybody? Thank you for listening to On The Margin. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about a very special offer that we have coming out of BlockWorks Research. Now, many of you will probably be familiar with our platform, but BlockWorks Research is the most blue chip spot to get research, data, governance, models, and a whole lot more about the leading DeFi protocols in the space. I've leaned on our analysts time and time again to explain complicated concepts going on in DeFi to me like I'm five years old. They can do the same for you. If you invest in DeFi or are just interested in it, it is an absolute no-brainer. As a listener of On The Margin, and to say thank you all for listening to the show, you can use Margin 10 for a 10% discount, and that gives you access to everything, which would be weekly in-depth reports, live data, all of that good stuff. So again, that's code MARGIN10 for a 10% discount. Link is in the show notes. Sign up now. Thank you later. Travis, I, I want to move into this portion here where you talk about financial nihilism. You're just starting to allude to alts. And for folks who might be a little bit less familiar with the the pricing and interrelationship between the price of Bitcoin and ETH and alts, just consider alts sort of like a levered bet on the price action of Bitcoin or ETH, which I think is how a lot of market participants broadly think about it. And you know, you had some very interesting notes here just about the expectation of market participants. And if you listen to Eric Balkunas and James Safer discuss this during the ETF as well, they remarked several times, you know, just how outlandish the expectations were for crypto participants about Bitcoin ETFs. And, you know, to paraphrase Eric, he was, you know, kind of shaking everyone saying, hey, guys, you're basically upset that this didn't double overnight. This is a home run success, you know, within the entire Hallmark uh, Hall of Fame of ETFs prior. And I think that relationship even between alts and Bitcoin and ETH is even on steroids. And you have a couple of great lines here. You know, what, a 100% pump? You know, what is this, a pump for ants? Uh, and you connect that return expectation to this idea of financial nihilism. And, you know, the, the kind of quote here that you have is, you know, why not put $500 into a meme coin that could 50x, knowing that you'd likely lose most or all of it. It's not like that 500 is going to make a difference anyway. Neither is $1,000 or $5,000. So, can you unpack what this idea of financial nihilism is and how it is fueling this huge boom in speculative industries all over, not just crypto? Yeah, it's not my term. I just want to give a shout out to Dimitri Kofinas, uh, yeah. which is, I don't know if he invented it. I, I can't remember, but I heard it on his podcast a few years ago for the first time. It definitely resonated. And, you know, <laughs> if you're... It, if you're a crypto market participant and you don't think that this is a dominant feature of the crypto market, you are, you're, you're just fooling yourself. This is, this is a dominant feature for the crypto market. It, it, it is. And, and, and it is just this view. And I can speak, you know, much more to, to American, you know, to kind of the American mindset than I can internationally. Uh, you know, I think a lot of it is also true as you step internationally as well too um you know i think gambling in general means you know just different different cultures have different types of relationships with gambling broadly and that certainly flows into this kind of financial nihilism 
component and, uh, you know, <laughs> Ponzi schemes, you know, they just mean, they mean something different in, in different parts of the world than they mean in America. And there's a different acceptance level and all this kind of thing. So, and, and all of that is relevant to this conversation in, in, in America, you know, it, it is just this view that, that the American dream is just not, uh, within reach up, you know, upward mobility, American dream, you know, I was born lower class and I'm going to die, uh, you know, middle class and my kids are going to die upper middle class, like that kind of thing. Like that's just, you know, the view is that that is just not really available to nearly as many people as it was a generation or two generations ago. And there are a pile of statistics to point you to that being true. And, you know, one just headline one is, right, the relationship between median home prices and median weight, median income, and and, the, and that relationship being so incredibly out of whack. But there's a bunch of other statistics you could point to as well, too. And I I back that up with with the, you know, the the popularity of 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 online gambling is skyrocketing skyrocketing and um that's a big component of this as well too and and people are just trying to figure out ways to get a lot more money uh than they have right now you know i th i think social media i think social media also plays a component to this as well too because people you know wealth is flaunted on social media to a degree that you just rewind 10 years ago and it was just a lot harder to see that many people flexing. You just didn't have the availability of, of, of just getting hit over the head with people flexing constantly and, um, you know, and painting this picture of their life, which, you know, may or may not be an accurate characterization of their life. But, you know, I mean, all of this plays into this situation and, and dude, shit coining is like, you know, it's like, you know, it's like crypto traders, DJs, they call it Valhalla for a reason. Like, it's like, it's literally, it, that's the terminology that is used. Uh, and you're just trying to, oh, if I, I can just catch this token, if I can just catch this token, everybody's got the story of their buddy that, you know, put 25K in Shiba Inu and cashed out 9 million or whatever. It's like, everybody now has a story like that. Um, and uh, I just think that that feeling is stronger now than it has been in prior cycles and the conviction that those opportunities will be there in the next 12 to 18 months. That conviction is higher now than it ever has been in the six, seven years that I've been doing this full time. There is a token on a liquid exchange that is going to do a 2000% up in the next 12 months. It's out there. You can buy it right now. I don't know what it is, but you get my point, right? So what does that tell you? I mean, is there something to be learned from that? Even just hearing you describe that, I would agree with you. And I feel it myself. Yeah, I feel it myself. Like, yeah, these alts are probably going to way outperform Bitcoin and ETH. And I started asking myself, like, should I be more, you know, should I be adjusting how I'm thinking? But what does that tell you about the actual, you know, opportunity set if everyone already has that expectation or the price is already baked in more than they were or what you know is is it different this time because we all believe it like what do you think about that we could do a separate two-hour podcast of, of trying to dissect capital flows and just how tokens stay afloat how drawdowns happen you know how a token pulls down 95 percent in a bear and then hits an all-time high and new all-time highs in the next pair. And like trying to estimate like how much selling occurred to drive the price down 95% relative to like how much actual money came in to push it back up, right? And all these are all a lot of it, you know, if I was gonna try and summarize what could be a very long conversation, a lot of it in my view is smoke and mirrors. And then it's like you see this headline $1.7 trillion aggregate market cap. And it's just like, what like what does that number actually mean? Like, well, it certainly doesn't mean that you could sell a $1.7 trillion worth of crypto. That's definitely not what it means. But does it mean you could sell half that much and price would go down 50%? No, it definitely doesn't mean that. 
It, you know, it doesn't mean anywhere close to that. And so like the liquidity characteristics relative to the market cap of a given token or a bunch of tokens or the, you know, the crypto market overall, you know, this is like a very confusing, obfuscated, um, you know, it's just uh, it's just an obfuscated concept, um, and it's something that I talked with with other market participants about. Market participants about it's more clean for Bitcoin than any other asset. Like mm -hmm. it's like you can you can you can better relate Bitcoin's inflows and outflows to its changes in market cap. And there's like a more clear relationship between those than any other crypto asset for sure. But even that, like you know, I think is, is, um, is tricky. And I've, I, I've experienced it, you know, firsthand because I've bought and sold a lot of crypto in my life. I've, I've bought and sold billions of dollars of Bitcoin in my life mm -hmm. and like, and a lot of others in aggregate, you know, a few billion dollars worth of like, like everything else as well too, I would say. And man, sometimes like, you can get in there, like, let's just pick a random large cat. Let's pick Solana, for example. Sometimes you can get into Solana and you want to buy $20 million worth of Solana and it'll take you, you know, it'll happen right at last price and it'll take you a couple minutes or, or something like that. And sometimes it's like you go and want to buy $20 million Solana and you can't get a million dollars before price starts running away from you. And the opposite is true as well, too. So sometimes you can go to Solana and you can sell $20 million worth of Solana. It'll happen right at last price. It'll take you a minute to get it done. And sometimes you go to Solana and you try and get a 500K and price just starts falling away from you. And so it's like the, the liquidity around these names relative to dollars coming in and coming out, it, that is such a drastically um, uh, stochastic type of relationship that like trying to put these, like, you know, I don't know, trying to put these rules of thumb on that is, is, is a challenging thing to do. Um, yeah, that was a bit of a ramble, but... No, it was really interesting. Frankly, it's just not something I've spent a whole lot of time thinking about. I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not trading billions here. I'm, I'm uh, definitely in a lower, lower price target than that. But it's a really interesting point. I, I would say even, I'm not sure how much that relationship is even wildly different from TradFi. Obviously, much uh, deeper, more liquid markets. But you, know, you look at the, the aggregate value of US real estate, it's like, that doesn't mean yeah, you know, it's a similar thing, right? If you started to sell off a, a massive chunk of that, if 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 you know even a quarter or a tenth of those people wanted to sell their house at the same time, it'd be a massive problem. Um, and you can see that. I mean, the banking system, depending on how you view it, is solid because we've got regulators that step in, or you could say it's extremely fragile because we need regulators to step in every year. Otherwise, it would completely implode. So, w one of the one of the uh, I wanted to bring you back, Travis, a little bit to this idea of financial nihilism and how that's trickled down into concrete sort of methods for valuing these things because it's very very difficult to do. Is I just want to underscore what an important point I, th I thought that is. I, I pinged you before this episode, but I also got this idea from Dim Dimitri Kofinas. It, it's kind of a foundational uh, change in how I viewed the world, actually, and. You know, the way, the way that I would liken it to is, you know, I have this personal experience of trying to set sales targets for people. Um, and basically, the science behind it is you're trying to set something that feels like a stretch goal, but it's achievable because then people will like work hard. They're like, OK, I can hit this and then they'll try to blow through it. But if you were to set a goal and it was so high that they're like, I'm there's no way I can hit that. People just give up. They just give up right away. And I feel like that is what has basically happened to especially the younger generation. And I saw you called out housing prices as uh, as something that people care a lot about. I mean, you can just talk to young people, talk to millennials, talk to Gen Z. They view it as impossible. You know, the idea of saving up for a home is like a pipe dream or a fairy tale. And I do think it's made a lot of people basically want to just press that red button, chuck 50 bucks into the lottery. And yeah, it is it is a damaging thing for society in general. It is bad for, there's way less productive risk taking that ends up happening. People feel like they give up, they're not bought in. Yeah, it is. I just, no, no question there really. I just wanted to underscore what a powerful point I thought that was. I think, I mean, well, what's the stats? Close to half of 18 to 29 live with their parents, right? In America? Yeah. Yes. Nuts. Like, like, never mind buying a house. They, like, they can't even make rent work. Like, or, or, or I don't know, maybe they're saving up for a down payment, you know, I but I mean, it's like, that's a, that's a stunning statistic to me. So, um, yeah, things things are changing. I agree. 
Travis, can you walk us through for folks who might be a little bit less familiar with the valuation methodologies for now? I mean, this is one of the challenges of Bitcoin forever, right? It's uh, it's got no cash flow. I can't value this thing. But that's a that's a common uh, challenge for valuing all of these different crypto assets, you know, whether it's ETH or Solana or Celestia or whatever. So can you walk through, you know, walk the audience through how fund managers or investors sort of come up with this idea of relative uh, valuation methodology and how that kind of assigns value to the, the longer tail of crypto assets? Yeah, I mean, in r- relative valuation means something different in tradition, like say in equities, for example. I can, you know, the valuation methodologies are well defined in equities because we've been valuing equities for a really long time. Uh, and that's not to say that there has not been an evolution of valuation methodologies for equities because that's not true. There, there has been. Um, it started out with a dividend discount model a long time ago. And then people said, oh, well, you don't have to dividend all of the earnings out because you want to like retain earnings and then spend those earnings to then grow the business. So let's just look at earnings. So then you got like price to earnings ratio. And then people were like, yeah, but like earnings has like, you know, taxes in it and it's got capital structure effects in it. So let's just look at, you know, maybe like a free cat, like a, some type of cash flow metric. People came up with EBITDA. Oh, we'll do EV to EBITDA. We'll do, you know, free cash flow generation, this, that, and the other. For tech companies, it's like, oh, we don't care if they're profitable. So let's just look at revenue. You know, it starts getting wackier and wackier. Let's just look at like, you know, monthly active users. We don't care about revenue. We'll figure out revenue at some other point. Users is what really matters, right? So there has been an evolution of that. But crypto is not equity. It's not a currency. It's not a commodity. It has characteristics, I would say, so, or some cryptos have characteristics of all three of those, but they're not, they don't exactly fit into any of those buckets. And so valuation is, you know, I think in crypto is a, is a very wide open space. And it's, I think it's one of the reasons that it's one of the real reasons that things can get really wacky from like a market cap perspective is because there's just a lack of anchoring and there continues to be a lack of anchoring today. Um, and so the people now relative valuation is people just go, what's the market cap of Bitcoin? Okay. What's the market cap of ETH? And then they just move down market cap and they just go, okay, well, all of these things are cheaper than that. So it should have room to run. Oh yeah. And the last two cycles, that's exactly how things ran. Right. So that's that mimetic reflexivity that I'm talking about that is very, the mimetic reflexivity can take hold much more strongly when there is not uh, widely agreed upon valuation metrics like a price to earnings or an EV to EBITDA or something like that. It allows people to just go, oh, BTC's running. ETH, cheap to, ETH is cheap to BTC and it ran last time, so it's going to run. Oh, Salon and all these other L1s, they're cheap to ETH. Oh, and th- all this shit ran last time, so it's going to run. Oh, and like, damn, dog coins had a good run last time, so like dog coins are probably going to run. And, uh, you know, people try and look at some of this kind of, these kind of adoption metrics, but we run, crypto is so fully embraced the, these, these Ponzi, uh, Fugazi adoption metrics that it obfuscates you don't really know how much like actual adoption there is because there's so much airdrop shit going on and there's so much t- you know last cycle it was tvl farming right and uh you, you know tvl people were like oh price the tvl market cap the tvl tvl is growing so price should go up there's a reflexivity to that as well too how do you get this reflexivity started oh we're going to give people all this yield and we're going to pay them these Ponzi tokens and the yield's going to be higher at first, right? And that obfuscates, you don't actually know if people are actually using any of this shit. It's like very hard to like parse. And then this cycle, right now we're doing points farming, right? Oh, we're going to incentive, make people do all these different types of activities so they get the points. And then in the future, they get the airdrop. The airdrop's going to be worth something. 
you know, and I still, I still don't really have a, a firm understanding. Maybe you, I mean, I know how much you pay attention to all this stuff. Maybe you can explain to me, like, where is the bid coming from to buy all of the airdrops once they happen and people sell the airdrops? And it's like, where is all of that money coming from? And it's like, are, 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 are these companies that, you know, they raise 200 million and they just peel off half of that to just catch the airdrop? Like I, that part, I don't have this firm of an understanding on. I know some people stake and they believe in the project. And they're like, oh, I'm going to stake. And then on, on AMMs and they get, you know, you get a bunch of, of, of tokens and I don't know, but like, um, maybe, maybe I'll pause there. Yeah. So I've, I've got less of, I have, I have a lot of thoughts on this and I I'll, I'll break it into two sections here. One is more of a direct response, uh, you know, to your question there. And then one is, is maybe something to consider that actually might be somewhat quote unquote different this time in this cycle from, from previous cycles. Um, you know, to respond to, I think one of the challenges actually is ironically the regulatory posture from the U S has has made things like exponentially worse in terms of this like ponzification dynamic that you're mentioning. And what makes it worse is that I think ultimately what I would love as a as a as an end state for crypto is that the issu issuing tokens wakes people up to the way that the idea that the way we issue equity in this country makes no sense. The frictions are extremely high when they don't ultimately need to be. And in the same way that issuing equity to employees of a company was a massive unlock that we discovered a long time ago with joint stock corporations, we are eventually going to understand that issuing equity to early customers is a massive tool in our tool belt for solving the cold star problem. Now, the issue with that is that if we make these tokens look equity-like at all, aka provide real value, investor protections, access to potential cash flows down the road, the SEC will say, nope, that's a security. So what we... <laughs> It's like we're getting the worst of both worlds because we want this dynamic of solving this cold start problem, but we have to make the token useless. So it's like a lose-lose situation is the worst of all worlds. I just recognize that that's a problem now, but I'm optimistic that we're going to solve for that eventually in the future. And I actually think if you look over the long arc of history, I don't know if this is five years or 10 years or whatever, over the long arc of history, technology ends up changing uh, policy much more than policy ends up changing technology. That's not to say that you know policy hasn't tried to get in the way of technology adoption. It almost always does, but usually technology ends up winning. Now, here here's something that I would point out broadly that might be different, Travis, uh, from last time. Is I think one of the reasons why we haven't had you know this kind of like mass adoption or like this what is the app that's going to get 50 million users or whatever is we haven't had cheap abundant quality block space like you mentioned block like, like that is the thing to me that is different this time and you know we it's it's kind of funny the history of crypto is a bunch of nerds viciously fighting around really small tech like architecture differences in blockchains and then constructing narratives to procure popular support that's like what the block size wars was i think the block size wars we we probably came to the right conclusion there but there was another viable path. Like the big blockers had a viable path. I'm not defending the people in that camp. I'm defending the vision of what they ultimately were trying to, to advocate for. And most of the blockchains that we've seen since Bitcoin, look, they're not getting more secure. They're not getting slower or more ossified. They're, it's been a one-way evolution, which is largely bigger blocks, um, faster, more performant, and trying to obviate some of the negative consequences that come along with that. And what people would say in past cycles is, oh, yeah, we've had cheap block space this whole time. Yeah, you've had cheap, shitty block space on centralized chains this entire time. No entrepreneur worth their salt is going to go take a chance on XYZ random L1 that's probably not going to be here two years from now. You're going to build on ETH because you're not taking nearly the amount of platform risk, right? You've heard of this idea of like platform risk, right? Platform risk, platform risk. But now what's different, and so then you can only explore use cases where a transaction costs anywhere from $50 to $150. That is so limiting. That is so limiting. That has been solved. That has literally been solved uh, through all DA layers like Celestia. It's been solved by roughly I, by Solana. And so now the, like when I look at consensus in crypto, the last consensus trade that I see is infrastructure over apps. This is what it kind of like, there's a good reason for that. It takes a long time to build infrastructure out. I think the positive spin on what you've been describing is that you need a speculative bubble to, to 
to pay for the infrastructure that the apps are eventually going to get built on. But what I look around and see is like, ultimately, that has been solved to the degree where you can actually build an app like Farcaster that is gaining product market fit as we speak. So that would be the only, that was going to be the only pushback that I was going to give you on like this shit isn't going to work. A lot of it's going to fail. I think infra is largely going to be a bloodbath for many investors who like didn't have a strong thesis and were just looking to flip a token. But I am actually more optimistic that we get uh, either consumer application categories or, or or something that ends up working this cycle more than it has in the past. And it's because of this dynamic as of cheap block space on a platform that you actually want to build on. So that, that was my monologue and rant. I'd be curious to get your thoughts on that. No, it's good. Yeah. And I, and I don't disagree with that. And I, I, I did try and like somewhat kind of humorously like sort of like introduce that caveat. Right. Mm. And it was like the, the shoeless Joe Jackson line. I, I was basically making the point that like, because, you know, I'm, I don't really think of myself as a technologist. Um, I don't have nearly the imagination for this stuff that, you know, a lot of the, uh, you know, the bright minds in crypto have. Um, and I think the bright, you know, minds that are more technologists would say what you said. And they would say, you know, now we're about to have, you know, cheap, reliable, abundant, safe block space. And that, you know, like field of dreams, if you build it, they will come. And that that was the missing piece and that these use cases are going to, you know, appear like shoeless Joe Jackson in a cornfield in Iowa. Right. And, and, and. I think what I'm saying is that I would just guess that that's not going to happen in this cycle because I would guess that I would see things on the horizon at this point. They would be like, oh, maybe it's going to be that. And I, 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 I don't see those right now. Mm. Like, I just don't see. And, and, you know, and maybe we could even like, like, because if you wanted to take the other side of that and maybe you, we just take it for, you, you could take the other side of it for the sake of this conversation and we could try and like narrow in like how we want to define like what successful end user adoption would look like for this cycle, you know? And I, I mean, I don't know how even how to put, you know, uh, how, how exactly you would put, you know, numbers around that monthly active users, daily active users, but you would need to try and, you know, like normalize for, you know, the pon all the Ponzi shit that's going on. So maybe it would be like, you would try and define success in this cycle by what the like bottom of the bear of the following cycle looked like, you know, like, yeah. it's like, I don't know if you had 2 million, if you had 2 million people use it, 2 million people a day using anything at the bottom of the next bear, like, you know, maybe that's how you would define it or something like that. Right. Or a million people a day using it, something at the bottom of ne the next bear. Um, but I just wouldn't, I don't see, I don't see stuff that's like, you know, I don't know, helium, you know, helium could get there. Maybe I don't know, render, maybe render could get there. Can, um, can, I've got one to just, this is a, a topical one because everyone is talking about it, but I will say, uh, I don't know if Farcaster is going to end up working, but I have always looked at crypto as the most likely technology sector to disrupt social media. And the reason that I feel like that is because one, it's a monopoly, right? It's like the air, it's antitrust in, is already a thing around social media in the US. The advantage, the moat that these social platforms have are network effects, right? That like everyone, but, but actually this is one thing that crypto and tokens do really well. They solve cold start problems. That is, that is the, the it's like, the, it's a kryptonite for, for network effects, I think, if done well. The other thing is no one likes social networks anymore. Social networks used to have this great brand. They were cool. Now everyone thinks they're destroying democracy or at the very least, they they kind of suck, right? They're like, okay, you guys are corporate. You were pretending not to be for a long time, but you're extracting a huge amount of money. And one thing that has been interesting to watch about what Elon has done at X is he's done the thing that makes sense. He said, look, the internet is not really an open internet anymore. It's like five companies. And these are walled gardens. And we are we used to make bones about them not being walled gardens, but they're a walled garden. It's within my interest, you know, for X users to stay on platforms and not 
So, if, you know, if you're a publication like Blockworks and you post on Twitter, you know, we're just going to downvote that because I don't actually want people leaving Twitter. That is that is that sucks for Blockworks. That sucks because we acquire users through Google and Twitter. And increasingly, mm -hmm. both of our avenues are getting closed off. And so eventually, like this was like a tenable problem for a long time. But now they've just accelerated the timeline about being less hospitable to third party publishers. And so, you know, I can just look at something like Farcaster, which is a completely different business model than my understanding of the business model of Farcaster is like there's a one layer down where you essentially want to own the social graph and then, you you know, clients or, or front ends can build and leverage that social graph. And it just aligns incentives a lot better. The incentive for Farcaster is always to link you, the user, to where you actually want to go. And it makes sense for Blockworks because I'm like, Twitter doesn't want me on here anymore. You know, Twitter does mm. not want my content. This no longer makes business sense for me. So, you know, I, I like... Sorry, sorry. Just so I make sure I understand that. Why doesn't Twitter want your content anymore? Because... Imagine, like, my objective for through Blockworks is to post articles and podcasts so that you can find them and then go listen to the podcasts or the articles. That is not in Twitter's best interest because then you have left the platform and then that is less inventory that they can serve ads to. So that's why when you click on a Twitter link now, it doesn't take you out. It takes you into this shitty, like, AMP thing and then you can only just click done and you go right back. So... That is the misalignment. And so so all of this to say, like, I don't want to go too down the weeds on this one specific thing, but there are, I, I think you can actually look and see more use cases than, than you might think in, in these regards where it's like, there are a lot of industries which are, you know, the, the, the market structure isn't what they used to be. They're not serving users anymore. People aren't happy with. And, you know, if you kind of took this crypto as, uh, you know, designing incentives and uh, solving cold star problem, there, there are some things that you could do. That, that being said, honestly, two million users, two million daily active users at the bottom of the next bear would be really good. I was literally going to say like ten million daily active users at the, the peak of this top, and two million at the bottom next time. I think that yeah. would be a good outcome. Yeah, yeah. Um, Travis, I'd love to um, maybe maybe close here, zooming out of crypto for a little bit, and get your thoughts on. Just so, you know, we talked a little bit at the top of this podcast about the macro and you included in a caveat on your thread that, you know, depending like macro could be a shit show and that could change all of this. But, I, you know, what do you think roughly in terms of like one thing I was thinking about is the the market was pricing in six rate cuts. Powell has explicitly said there are going to be three rate cuts. You know, how do we ultimately end up reconciling those two views and does it have implications for asset prices? And then, I, and then I kind of want to finish up on the dynamics of the bond market and the QRA as well. Well, I think Powell went on 60 Minutes last night and, and, and you know, took you from six cuts to three cuts. Yeah. And stocks and what are, stocks are flat today. The crypto's flat to up today. And it's like last week, we thought we were going to get a cut in March. And at the presser, he took March off the table. And, uh, you know, stocks pulled back about, you know, I don't know, a percent and a half. And then a couple tech companies blew the wall, you know, blew earnings out of the water. And you, you know, you re retraced all that and, you know, we're back at new all time highs. So it just, it, you know, it does seem like, uh, you know, I don't know. It, yeah. It just, it, it, it seems to me that the Fed is going to be supportive. I, I struggle to see where the macro skeletons are going to fall out of the closet this year. Um, I mean, I can't really tell what's going on with China. It looks, you know, quite bad. Um, but it seems like that's going to be, you know, more easing and more liquidity injecting type of stuff than something that would, I mean, I don't know, maybe I guess if it got bad enough, maybe it could like really crash the crypto market, you know, maybe, but I, th that, that wouldn't be my base case. And that kind of like free walk idea I was talking about was that I was like struggling to see the skeletons in the macro closet this year. And then I was also struggling to see the skeletons in like the crypto closet as well too, like the idiosyncratic stuff. You know, I think there would have been other times when I've been wor more worried about the government selling Bitcoin, their big stack of Bitcoin or Mount Gox distributions, that kind of stuff. But it it seems like with these ETFs that we've just found a 
a bid that it is present that it's like you you just worry a lot less about the you know the real crashes you know bitcoin maybe could you know it's like whatever the government brings you know 30,000 bitcoin to the market like you know it could trade weak for some sh- relatively short amount of time but it doesn't feel nearly as existential so, so. yeah I agree. And, you know, maybe to connect these two ideas and and start to wind down here, there's been a lot of focus on the supply dynamics of the bond market, which is primarily driven by issuance uh, from the U.S. Treasury. And I think we're running something like run rate, $2 trillion per year deficits as estimated by the CBO. And that that's you know no end in sight and typically you know the CBO Congressional Budget Office they tend to underestimate right so if anything it's probably going to be worse than that and I'd connect that with a pretty interesting exchange during that Jay Powell sixty minutes interview where you know he was asked are you worried about the fiscal position and the debt of the United States and he said long term it is unsustainable and he pointed out this this part of the math problem, which is pretty unescapable or unavoidable from my perspective, which is debt is growing faster than GDP. So all these GDP prints that everyone's looking at saying, hey, this is great. Look, our economy is so strong. Yeah, it better be. (laughs) It better be. We're we're literally not even getting our money's worth for all the debt that we're taking on. So, you know, any any color that you have about, you know, the the bond market as it stands today and sort of those long term uh, fiscal pressures that we're facing. Buy Bitcoin. Don't sell it. Keep in cold storage, <laughs> buy more on this, you know, like it's, it is yeah. it's truly an advertisement for, for Bitcoin in my view. Um, and I've liked the moniker of Bitcoin as pristine collateral. I've liked that yeah. for, for a few years now. And I think it's, you know, this global financial system that we have is a debt laden financial system. There are turns and turns of debt in it. And the U.S. dollar is the world reserve currency, but treasuries are the collateral foundation of a, this global financial system that is very debt laden. And objectively, when you look at the sort of, you know, investment proposition of treasuries over the next few decades, that is a challenged investment proposition. And... um the, the 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 interesting thing is that then when you say, okay, well, I'm worried about the dollar, okay, two trillion a year in deficits, 37 trillion or whatever the number is, total debt, debt to GDP is out of whack, deficit to GDP, all this shit's out of whack, all the entitlement stuff that's coming, um, all you know, all that kind of stuff. When you look at that, you go, okay, well, where else would the world go to find a different world reserve currency? or a different collateral foundation for this debt-laden global financial system that we have, well, everybody knows that there's nowhere else to go. And the, 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 the phrase I always use here is that, is that you know, the United States has the best monetary policy house on a really shitty monetary policy block, which is true, because as soon as you look into any other country, it's way worse, right? Like, it's like the euro. Like, like, like what, are, what are we going to yeah. reuse? We're going to use ECB debt as the collateral foundation for the global, no, of course not. We're gonna use the yen. We're gonna use JGBs as the collateral found. No, of course not. We're gonna use the yuan. Like we're gonna, we, the, no, you're not gonna. You, like five, seven, ten years ago, I think China. You could have made a real argument with a straight face that China was that. I don't think you can make that argument anymore. I don't think. I don't think you can make a serious argument about about, you know, like size of, of GDP and that different conversation, what's going to be the global re- world reserve currency and what's going to be the, 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 the collateral foundation of the global financial system? I, I don't think China presents a real option. So it's, it's just interesting that you, you really very rapidly run out of places to look. And the next thing you know, you kind of look at this wacky magic internet money thing. You know, it's like, you know, it's like it's worth a trillion and change. It's heading higher. Larry Fink likes it now. Like, you can get it in these ETFs. And it's not like it's going to happen overnight. But that's just been kind of my view for a while is that if Bitcoin just sort of chips away at 
Treasury's market share over the course of this decade that gets 2030 and Bitcoin just looks like it's kind of made a little bit of progress in that. And then, you know, you fast forward another 10 years, you get to 2040 and like now maybe it's like taking like a pretty decent chunk away from treasuries. If, if that's the timeline that it, it ends up like playing out, then we're going to go to we're going to go to 100,000 and then we're going to go to 200,000 Bitcoin. We're going to go to 500,000 Bitcoin and then we're going to go to a million, you know, and it's like, it's just going to, it's just going to keep working and it's going to keep working. And, and, um, you know, I, I do think that that is like the most compelling value proposition for Bitcoin. And at some point it's going to be millennials and Zoomers that are going to be pulling the trigger on deciding how all this stuff actually happens. And like, you know, I think our generation is a lot more likely to like consider something like that. So. Yeah. Well said. Well, well, Travis, I, look, I really appreciate the time coming on the pod. If folks want to find out more about you, follow you, the work that you do at Icky Guy, what's the best way to do that? Yeah. Uh, Travis underscore Kling at Twitter is always good. You can find a link to the fund uh, in, in my bio. I write a monthly. It goes out first every month. People like it. So that, that's what that, that Twitter thread was from. So um, yeah, appreciate the time, Mike. It was a pleasure. You as well, my friend. Love to do it again soon. Cheers. <laughs>